Yeah, and then the next year, Tupac gets killed. And you actually knew him from the, from the uh, Digital Underground days. Mm -hmm. Any interesting Tupac stories from back in the day? Um, not, not, not too many because the thing was Tupac and Digital, everybody in Digital, and I learned this from Money B, everybody in Digital had their solo projects, but yeah. when they were in Digital, digital it was Shock G's, uh, it, it was Shock G's vision. So a lot of my Tupac interesting stuff comes ironically after, after Digital and, and somewhat after he passed, to be honest, because while he was doing his solo stuff, um, I didn't, I didn't see, I didn't see him much at all. Uh, I had known, uh, Johnny J who produced a lot of tracks for him and, and, you know, and, and other, other people. So it was more of me just kind of watching from afar. And, you know, one interesting fact that I had never really shared in it with, with anyone when the Tupac movie came out, uh, I was doing a tour in Australia. We had eight shows in nine days and we ended in Perth. And on the ninth, you know, in, in, on the ninth day from Perth, after the, after the show, I get on the plane in sweaty clothes and, and do a cross-country flight to go to Sydney so that I could be there to co-host the first screening of the Tupac movie in a drive-in in Sydney. Hmm. So they interviewed me there. I did a performance. My voice was shredded, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, from all the shows I had done. But that's, you know, and it was something that warmed my heart because um, I was very, I was fond of Tupac. Tupac had said nice things about me that had gotten back to me. So it was just something that, that, that I was honored to do. Well, the next album comes out uh, independently. Mm -hmm. Return of the One Hit Wonder. <laughs> yes. I'll be honest, I kind of shook my head a little bit when I first... No, which is <laughs> fine. Now I'm telling because I mean... One hit wonder, and and by the way, I didn't consider myself a one hit wonder. I, I, I if I'm not mistaken, I think Principal's Office either went gold or was close to gold. Know How was a big record. I had written the two songs for Tone. Yeah. At that point, I was also starting to write for other outside people. So the one hit wonder was more how people regarded me as opposed to how I regarded myself. Right, and it's got a painting of you in a superhero yeah. outfit. Yeah, that was <laughs> so it fun. So like you're making fun of yourself in a, in a way. Uh, yeah, no, it's, de it's definitely self-deprecating. Yeah. Absolutely. And look, it's interesting. I mean, you especially see this on social media now. People will find things to make fun of you for, which they themselves will never come close to accomplish. Oh, Sure. 99.99% of artists who release music are no hit wonders. Yeah. Not only not only no hit wonders, but the the math at a major label was that one out of every 20 records are the ones to blow up. Right. So me that I was able to be part of multiple of those, I felt like I was in a good place. And to your point, I've said this before, you probably heard it in the Drink Champs interview, but I live by the by the creed. People who talk shit usually haven't done shit. Because yeah. if you're in this, then you know how hard it is. Oh, yeah. So there's music that I hear from artists that I don't necessarily like, but I'm not going to go out there and criticize them because I know what the fight is like. I know what the struggle is like. So someone, some, and I actually pride myself on going and listening to people's follow-up records. Okay, that's the single. What did they do once... They had the budget, had the money, was able to do everything they could artistically. Sometimes I find better music in those follow-up records, even if they didn't do as well commercially, because that's kind of how I approached it. Every record I made, I'm like, okay, if this is the last record I ever make, I want it to be the best representation of myself. Well, yeah, and you had some more albums after that. The fifth album uh, was Ain't Going Out Like That. Then the sixth album, Engage the Enzyme. En enzyme. Engage enzyme, the sorry. Enzyme, yeah. Engage. My rhymes are like wine, made from grapes on the vine, getting better with age to engage the enzyme. That's the lyric from that. I mean, by this time, have you sort of accepted that you're now kind of more of a legacy artist and you're not going to be number one on the charts anymore and you're just doing it because you love to do it? Or what was really your, your mindset at this well, point? I had a bachelor's in economics, right? So every record that I put out after my major major label releases, every record that I put out was paid for by licenses. Hmm. If I never toured them, if I never did did you know videos with them or anything, it was either a commercial or a video game or a TV show. You could have the guy with the bust and move voice, but you wouldn't have to pay 100, 150 grand for the bust and move master. You could get it for a tiny fraction of that 
and get something that is talking about a topic that fits your, you, you know, whatever you're selling or, or you know, wh whatever the movie is or whatever the TV show is. So that was my approach is like for all those years to get those licenses and to, to, to see music that a lot of people didn't know. Plus, I'm still touring because everybody wants to see Bust the Move. So I may have a 20 minute set. Bust the Move is only basically five minutes. And if I do an intro to it, you know, maybe seven. But I got, you know, 13, 15 minutes that I could do whatever the hell I wanted. So a lot of that would be my newer material. So now I'm at a point now where when I'm going out and touring, I'm doing a bunch of songs at the beginning that people don't know, but they perform so well that I'm able to win them over. And I see my streams go up in certain markets after I leave doing the new stuff. And that that's heartwarming to me because it made the time outside of, you know, Bust the Move and Stone Cold Rhyming, it made the time since then worthwhile. Like the things that I was doing to make popular music or make hit music could actually resonate with people. And I can really, really uh, drill, drill down on that from the stage. I mean, in terms of licensing, what do you think was the biggest payday you got from your song being licensed? I mean, well, remember now, up until Reversion, I'm not. I, I'm seeing what some of the numbers are if they shared the deals with me. Reversion is what? Reversion is 35 years after the release of a record that the copyright becomes non-exclusive. So the artist can take part in it. So Okay, well, does it get returned to you though? No, it's not a question of being returned to you. It means the rights aren't exclusively the labels. Okay, so for example, Dame Dash is going through this right now, uh -huh. right? He's got a third of reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he lost the lawsuit and he's being forced to sell it at auction. Right. And before the auction went live, Jay-Z chimes in and said, well, whoever buys it is only going to have it for five years because it's going to revert back to me. But you're saying it doesn't actually revert to the owner, well, to the original uh, writer? Well, or? well, well it, it, how can I put it? If someone wants to take a song and put it in a film, right? For the first 35 years of a record deal, the, the, the copyright owner, the, the label owner is the only person, that, basically the only entity that can make that deal. After 35 years, the artist can take part in that. The artist can go make the deal. So if you're in a situation where the artist is big and powerful, then they own the master rights and the like, when the reversion happens, they can basically use their power to, you know, to say, okay, you know, we're going to exclude anybody from the outside, especially if the person from the outside is not part of the original, you know, copyright okay. creation, you know, set. So in terms of licensing, mm -hmm. the biggest payday for Bust a Move came from what? Um, I didn't see all the deals, dude. I know that it would have to be well over 100 grand, probably, you know, at least, at least 150 to 200 grand. I couldn't tell you what. It would probably be a film. Okay. Um... The, the royal, now, the royalty situation might be something different where there's a decent advance and then the thing gets played into the ground and and, and the royalties come up. But yeah, I, in terms of uh, seeing like a big seven-figure thing on paper, I've never seen that before. Yeah, I remember I interviewed uh, Sir Bix a lot. He told me with a completely straight face that he has made over $100 million off Baby Got Back. And I believe he said, my lifestyle now hasn't changed <laughs> since right. the song came out and blew up. Right. And it's in a lot of movies. It's yeah, in yeah. a lot of commercials. Like, And streaming makes it more interesting too because you, all of a sudden a movie that that hasn't been played in a while all of a, all of a sudden gets on a streaming platform yeah. and you know they start going back and say, okay, what songs were in this and how long is that? And all of a sudden you're, you know, you're, you're seeing money out of that pool as well. So it, it, it's something, it's like a gift that keeps on giving. In retrospect, Knowing what you know now, if you had signed the deal that you could have signed, how much do you think between the Tone Loke records and your record would you have made? I don't even think like that, Vlad. I know you want. <laughs> I know you want a juicy answer, dude. But but I don't even think like that. Well, because they're huge records. No, they were saying. huge yeah. records. But here's the thing: my whole life experience, my whole career experience, music musician experience, writer experience, is like. A, you know, a, a really well-knit sweater. So if you're asking me to pull on a string to see what it would be like, by the time I keep pulling on that string, it's not gonna be a sweater anymore. Okay, so for, for, for me to put it into context, like, oh, if I change this one thing, what would the rest of it be like? That might've screwed everything else up. I feel you. You know what I mean? So, but so owning the publishing to all those songs and then everything else like yeah, that. Yeah, I and... wrote all those songs, dude. That's how I look at it. It's like, okay, there's, there's other stuff that I own all the publishing on. I still have, you know, 
having what I had on Busted Move is not a bad thing. Trust me, the, yeah. like getting that getting the Busted Move publishing back is a seven figure decision over you know over time. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. Yeah. That's a win. Like you said, there's a lot of no hit wonders. Exactly. And there's a and then there's a lot of one, two, three, four hit wonders that got no publishing on anything ever. Yeah, that's you true. You know what I mean? So that's how I gotta look at it is in terms of where I am. I'm not I'm not looking about uh it's kind of that thing where where uh a tiger's chasing you and it's like, oh, you know, you gotta be faster than the tiger. No, I just gotta be faster than the slowest guy. 